other disasters defy prediction and belief. The southern coast of Louisiana, where the water flows everywhere. Shallow lakes full of catfish, broad bayous, canals dotted with shrimp boats, all leading to the Gulf of Mexico. On November 20th, 1980, water would play the key role in one of the strangest and most spectacular engineering disasters ever. This was once the shaft of the Jefferson Island salt mine, where men had been pulling salt out of the earth since 1919. Louisiana's salt lies in gigantic underground domes, some larger than Mount Everest, which are pushed upward by the force of the heavier rock that surrounds them. Part of the Jefferson Island mine is located directly under Lake Peñure. The mine, which was operated by the Diamond Crystal Salt Company, shared space on Jefferson Island with a lush botanical preserve known as Live Oak Gardens. There's another abundant resource deep under Lake Peñure, one frequently found in pockets near salt domes. It's as black as the salt is white. That salt moves upward and it pierces through surrounding strata, sands, clays, and, and limestones. And this piercing produces faults and folds within, the, within these surrounding sediments, producing an ideal mechanism to trap oil. So it was hardly surprising that Texaco was conducting exploratory drilling close to the Jefferson Island salt mine in November of 1980. On November 20th, the two delicate underground and underwater operations, drilling oil and mining salt, collided in spectacular fashion. Well, it was a typical day in November the 20th, 1980. A nice, cool, crisp day, clear skies. People were fishing out on the lake, as they, they usually do. Um, the mine was in full operation. But in the pre-dawn hours, the oil drilling crew on Lake Peñor had run into a problem. At five or 600 feet, they hit salt. And they were not supposed to hit salt for another couple of hundred feet. The drill bit became stuck. The crew heard strange popping sounds. The oil rig tilted badly to one side. And at that point in time, the drillers recognized that they had a fairly serious problem on their hands. What they didn't realize is the 14-inch drill bit had punctured the roof of the salt mine at the 1,300-foot level, creating a funnel for Lake Peñor to drain into. It was apparently the result of a simple miscalculation. It seems that there was an engineering error in the the location of the Texaco well. They used a form of triangulation for determining the location, and one of the points they used for triangulating was uh, in error. And consequently, it rotated the location of the borehole about 400 feet closer to the main mine than it should have been. 90 minutes after the drill became stuck, the drilling crew, who had wisely abandoned the tilting rig, watched in amazement from the shore as their 150-foot derrick disappeared into a lake that was less than 10 feet deep. Meanwhile, 1,300 feet below the surface of Lake Peñor, diamond crystal miners, who had not been alerted to a problem, looked up to see something you should never see in a salt mine. Water. Water flowing through salt tends to dissolve the salt. As you increase the volume of water, you increase the volume of salt that can be dissolved. Soon it was clear. Lake Peñur was draining through the hole bored by the drill bit and into the salt mine. As the two and a half billion gallons of Lake Peñur surged into the mine with ten times the pressure of a fire hydrant, a mighty whirlpool was forming on the surface. Remarkably, thanks to well-rehearsed evacuation drills and the heroics of several miners, all 55 people in the mine managed to get out. But back on the surface, the chaos was just beginning. The whirlpool is basically a vortex of, of water and mud that is flowing down into a fairly confined space. And that whirlpool is basically flowing downwards under the force of gravity, pulling sediment and other materials down with it. The whirlpool sucking force pulled heavy duty barges toward it as their crews leapt for safety. Men watched with jaws agape 
as 11 barges and a tugboat disappeared into the vortex. Those are four fully loaded flatbed trucks spinning helplessly in the whirlpool. Enter Leon's Viator Jr., who had simply wanted to catch some fish that day. I was crazy enough to be on the lake November the 20th, 1980. So I asked my nephew to come with me on the boat and we're going to go catch some catfish. We went. We're going to go and try our luck. But as luck would have it that day, Viator soon found himself and his 14-foot boat being yanked toward the whirlpool and certain death. When we got further down on the lake, I spotted something, an eye in the ground. To me, it measured 100 feet in diameter. And there was a lot of barges all grouped to it. I didn't know what was happening. When a barge that was blocking the way was sucked into the hole, it gave Viator a narrow path to skirt the maelstrom. He gunned the motor and reached the shore with seconds to spare. Viator then tied his boat to a tree. When I looked like this, I seen my boat that I had tied to the tree, and there it was going into the whirlpool. So that's the last thing I've seen, my boat tied up to the tree going into the hole. By that point, the whirlpool was sucking down Jefferson Island itself. Before evening, 65 acres of land, including much of Live Oak Gardens, would end up at the bottom of the mine. 150-year-old trees were snapped in half. There were pecan trees that were 150 feet tall down here in this woods. And to stand there and watch them drop completely out of sight was, <laughs> yeah. Along the shoreline, along the Live Oak Gardens and the Jefferson Island Mansion, you're basically seeing what are called landslides, where the, the ground is actually shearing and breaking apart, and gravity's pulling these blocks down into the hole. Look at this over here, look! Look at that. Look at this! That house that we were standing on, uh, all you see now is a chimney. The, the house sank about 30 feet. Could things get worse? Yes. Delcom Canal, which normally flowed away from Lake Pinure and into the Gulf of Mexico, actually reversed direction under the intense sucking power of the whirlpool. As the water rushed into the now nearly empty lake bed, it formed a 150-foot waterfall, the highest ever in Louisiana. Well, that's the only time the Gulf of Mexico flowed north, basically. So that's a lot of water. You know, to fill up that hole. As the water rushed into the mine, its rapid displacement of the underground caverns shot a deafening blast of compressed air, and later, a 400-foot geyser up from the mine shaft. To see something like this, it was terrible, really. I thought it was the end of the world. It took two days for the canal's water to fill up the mine in Lake Penure. When the water pressure equalized, nine of the 11 sunk barges popped up like corks in a bathtub. The drilling operation and the underground salt mine were complete losses. The cause of the disaster was never officially determined, since all the evidence was at the bottom of a 1,500-foot water-filled salt mine. But there's no definitive evidence that the mine itself was structurally unsound. The culprit was most likely a 14-inch wide drill bit. This engineering disaster did have at least one positive effect. It made Lake Penure a little more interesting. It's a shallow lake, and now we have part of it that's a deep lake. So it's changed the type of fish that live in the lake, and we catch redfish and saltwater species that were not very prevalent here before. But not everyone is planning a fishing trip to Lake Penure. What I went through and got out of there alive, I don't, I don't care for it, really. I prefer buying my fish. It can hardly be said that the Jefferson Island disaster had a happy ending. The loss to livelihoods and cherished property was devastating. Yet the fact that no human beings perished was fortunate indeed. For if there's one lesson to take from this strange engineering disaster, it's that a small mistake can have huge consequences.